Today, we're checking out Intel's new Core Ultra 5 245K. This is the replacement for the Core i5 14600K. And with the current retail price of $320 US, it is going up against the recently released Ryzen 7 9700X. So I'm very keen to see how those two parts compare in both productivity and gaming workloads. Now, before we get into the benchmark data, let's quickly go over some of the basic specifications for the Core Ultra 5 245K. I'm going to skip a lot of the platform and testing information here as that was all featured in the 285k review so if there's anything that's missing here that you want to learn please go watch that video first. As for the 245k it features 6 P cores with 6 threads as hyperthreading is no longer used. The P cores feature a base frequency of 4.2 gigahertz with a boost of 5.2 gigahertz so that's a mere 2% frequency reduction when compared to the Core i5 14600k. Then there are the E cores, and in total we have eight, again with eight threads, as there's no SMT support, in other words, hyperthreading, and the cores operate at a base frequency of 3.6 gigahertz, but can clock as high as 4.6 gigahertz, which is actually quite a large 15% increase when compared to the E cores featured on the 14600K. In total, there's 24 megabytes of L3 cache and 26 megabytes of L2 cache. Each P core receives three megabytes of L2, while the E cores get four megabytes per cluster, and each cluster contains four cores. Finally, the base TDP is 125 watts, with a max turbo set at 159 watts. And finally, the MSRP for this part has been set at $310 US. It's also worth noting that all KSKU models, which are currently the only models that have been announced, support dual channel DDR5-5600 UDIM memory or DDR5-6400 CU DIM memory. In short, UDIM memory features a small clock driver circuit directly on the module, and this allows for more precise timings that are required to hit those higher memory frequencies. Now all models provide 20 PCIe 5.0 lanes and then 4 PCIe 4.0 lanes, along with a direct media interface 4.0 8 lane bus for the chipset. As usual, the KSKU processors have an unlock clock multiplier, and therefore they can be overclocked. Now for testing, there are multiple different test systems that we've used here, so rather than discuss all of the hardware featured in this video, you're welcome to hit the pause button to take a closer look. Okay, let's get in the data. So with the Core Liquid i360 strapped on, I loaded up the 245K in the Cinebench, where I saw an average clock frequency of 4.6 GHz for the E cores and 5 GHz on the P cores. And this was achieved while remaining within the stock 159 watt power limit. The CPU saw a peak core temperature of just 66 degrees, which is well below the 105 degree TJ Maxx. The 245K is 9% faster than the 14600K in the Cinebench multi-core test, and that meant it was 26% faster than the 9700X, which is an impressive result given it is slightly cheaper than the Ryzen 7 processor. The single core performance on the hand matched the 9700X, scoring 137 points, which is a 12% increase from the 14600K. Now, although the 245K was 26% faster than the 9700X for the multi-core test, it did also consume 46% more power at 139 watts, which is reasonable given that's the same level of power draw you'll see from a part such as the 7700X, it's also a 37% reduction in power usage when compared to the 14600K. Now, when it comes to compression performance, the 245K is disappointingly a little bit slower than the 14600K and just 8% faster than the 9700X. So not amazing performance for a next gen product. And sadly, the 245K is even worse when it comes to decompression performance, only matching much older parts such as the 12700K and 5800X 3D. And that made it 12% slower than the 9700X and 13% slower than the 14600K. The Blender open data results are better. Here the 245K is 7% faster than the 14600K and 16% faster than the 9700X. So if rendering on a budget is what you're after, the 245K does look pretty good. It also does quite well in the Corona 10 benchmark, beating the 14600K by a 7% margin and the 9700X by an 11% margin. So certainly not massive margins there, but at least it is faster. Now with a few tweaks, I've been able to improve the performance of the Arrow Lake CPUs in Photoshop to where they should be once Windows 11 is updated to better support them. Even so, the performance here isn't amazing. Sure, the 245K is 8% faster than the 14600K, 
but that meant it was still 10% slower than the 9700X, so not great. The Premiere Pro results are much better, as here the 245K is able to match the 14700K, making it 11% faster than the 14600K and 14% faster than the 9700X. Okay, so time for some gaming benchmarks, and we'll start with Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Here the 245K doesn't look particularly great, in fact it doesn't even look good, with just 142 FPS on average using the DDR5 7200 memory meant it was 7% slower than the 14600K and 12% slower than the 9700X. It does perform much better in The Last of Us Part 1, matching the 9700X with around 180 FPS on average, though the 1% low performance did look quite a bit better. And then when compared to the 14600K, uh, we're only looking at a 2% improvement, so not a great generational uplift there. Now, even with the prioritized P-Core option enabled in Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty, the 245K is still very slow, coming in behind even the 12600K. And this made it a whopping 16% slower than the 14600K and 17% slower than the 9700X. So a terrible result there. I really do hope Intel can address the performance in this title, because currently it's at an unacceptable level for a next generation product that costs this much money. The Hogwarts Legacy results are certainly better, but they're not that much better. Here the 245K was only able to match the 14600K, making it 8% slower than the 9700X. Next up we have ACC, and here the 245K gets demolished, coming in 5% slower than the 14600K but a massive 24% slower than the 9700X. And disappointingly, the 245K is only delivering 12700K light performance in this title. And the 245K also struggled in Remnant 2, delivering just 112 FPS on average, which is the same level of performance seen from the previous generation 14600K, and that meant it was 11% slower than the 9700X. For whatever reason, Intel CPUs perform quite poorly in Homeworld 3, particularly when looking at those 1% lows. And this applies to all models dating back to 12th gen. And of course, the 245K is no exception, coming in just behind the 14600K. And this meant the average frame rate was down 13% when compared to the 9700X, while the 1% lows were 43% lower. So another poor gaming result here for the 245K. And we have yet more bad news for the 245K, this time in a Plague Tale Requiem. And here we have another example where it somehow manages to be slower than even the 12600K. As a result, it trailed the 14600K by a 17% margin and the 9700X by an insane 27% margin. So again, hopefully Intel can work out what's going on here and address this miserable performance. The 245K also bombs out in Counter-Strike 2, again, delivering 12700K light performance with 400 FPS. And this time, that meant it was 13% slower than the 14600K and 24% slower than the 9700X. Starfield's one of the few games we've come across where the Arrow Lake CPUs look okay. And although just matching the 14600K is hardly impressive, Given what we've seen so far from the 245K, this is certainly one of the better results. It was also 10% faster than the 9700X, so for some reason the Zen 5 processors actually performed quite poorly in this title. And then we have the Space Marine 2 results which are pretty weak. Here the 245K is slower than both the 14600K and 9700X by a 6% margin, so that's not good. Now traditionally, Hitman 3 has been a strong title for Intel but not so much when it comes to Arrow Lake. The 245K was 9% slower than the 14600K, and worse still, wasn't able to beat the 9700X, coming in 4% slower. Oh boy, I'm not sure why the Watch Dogs Legion results are this bad. The 265K it wasn't exactly great, but the 245K is terrible, coming in dead last and by some margin we're talking about a 20% loss to the 14600K and 23% to the 9700X. So not much more needs to be said about these results. They're clearly very bad. The Star Wars Outlaws results are okay. And really, I suppose this is the worst result you would have hoped to have seen 
from the 245k, a 2% performance uplift over the 14600k. It's not exactly amazing stuff, but I guess at least it's faster. Now for a quick look at power consumption when gaming. The 245k consumed just 73 watts in Cyberpunk 2077, and that's a 13% reduction when compared to the 9700X, though remember it was 17% slower. So the Ryzen 7 part is actually more power efficient here. But if we look at The Last of Us Part 1, we see that the 9700X and 245k consumed roughly the same level of power for roughly the same level of performance. So in this example, power efficiency is much the same. The 245k was also a few percent faster than the 14600k, while reducing power consumption by a massive 38%. So great results there when compared to the previous generation. Now across the 14 games tested, the 245K was on average 8% slower than the 14600K and 14% slower than the 9700X. Both tragic results for a next generation product. Essentially, it was possible to achieve this level of performance back when the 12700K was released, while much better gaming performance was possible through the 5800X 3D or any number of previous and current generation Ryzen processors. Okay, so next up we have the cost per frame, and this really isn't anything to get excited about. In fact, the 245K is just 9% better value when compared to the 7800X 3D at its current inflated price tag of $475 US. And remember, that CPU could have been had for as little as $340 US not that long ago which would have resulted in a cost per frame of just $1.65. So as it stands right now, the 245K costs 14% more per frame than the 9700X, and a massive 36% more than the 14600K and 7700X, making it a very poor value choice for gaming, and that's despite being much better value than the 265K and 285K. So, more disappointing stuff from Intel's later CPU generation, and I had hoped that the Core Ultra 5 245K might have been a bit of a hidden gem, but sadly it's not. It's a mixed bag, like the rest of the lineup, and sadly there's probably more bad than there is good right now. In terms of performance, the productivity results were certainly much better than what we saw when gaming, but even then, they weren't exactly great. Outside of Cinebench and a few other rendering benchmarks, there's not much to get excited about here. The compression and decompression performance was down on the Core i5-14600K, though again we did see reasonable gains in most other workloads, but even then it didn't always beat the 9700X. In any case, as it currently stands, productivity performance is definitely a strength of the 245K, and of course power efficiency is also good, near enough to AMD that it's no longer an issue. They're really much the same in that regard. Where the 245K really fails was when it came to gaming performance. And although Arrow Lake in general has been really disappointing here, the 245K was even more of a mixed bag, if that's possible. In some games it was able to roughly match the 265K, but in others such as Cyberpunk, Counter-Strike 2, Hitman 3 and Watch Dogs Legion, it was quite a bit slower. And in most of those examples, it could be found towards the bottom of the graph, if not the bottom. As a result, the 245K is very poor from a value standpoint, and in fact, you'd actually be better off buying the Core i5-14600K, or better yet, the Ryzen 7 7700X. So for gamers, the 245K looks as though it's not going to be a viable option without some sort of major price improvement, and probably some more consistent performance wouldn't hurt either. Realistically, the price does need to drop, I would say, to about $250 US for it to become an option. I was going to say an attractive option, but... I think an option is probably a better description. Basically, it needs to come down to the current asking price of the 14600K. And even then, it wouldn't be obvious that you should buy it over the typically faster Core i5 processor. The power savings are certainly nice, but I really never thought the 14600K was too outrageous. It's certainly not an efficient CPU when compared to the likes of the 7700X, but if power bills aren't that extreme where you live, then most won't have an issue with the 14600K, as it's still relatively easy to cool. Even so, again, I never really recommended the 14600K anyway. For roughly the same money, the 7700X generally delivered better gaming performance while using substantially less power, so it seemed like a no-brainer. But let's say in a world where neither the 7700X nor the 14600K existed, the 245K still has to compete with the 9700X, and for gaming it just doesn't. 
The Ryzen processor is generally much faster and does deliver a more consistent gaming experience. For productivity, the 245K wins more often than not, though not always by a lot. But if you're talking strictly core heavy productivity, then sure, the 245K does look a lot better. But in most instances, anyone after heavy productivity performance will probably be looking beyond the 245K anyway. But if not, it does represent pretty decent productivity performance of $320 US. For now though, I just can't recommend anyone buys the 245K as there are better alternatives. Hopefully Intel can address the issues with Arrow Lake and soon, because I do feel there is a bit more to be had here. But until we see evidence of this, we just can't recommend these new CPUs. And that is going to do it for this review. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to become a Harbour Unbox community member, we have the join button on the YouTube video thing, or you can go to the description and find our Patreon account. Signing up to either one of those things will give you access to stuff like our Discord server, there's BTS content, uh, monthly live streams, Q&A stuff, a lot of cool things. So check that out if you're interested, but if not, it's perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.